Oh. <laughs> uh, I seem to be doing this lately. <laughs> I apologize. That was cool because I didn't hear the the other intro, and so I wasn't uh, I wasn't picking up on. Um, I had to get my act together here. So, okay. I'm glad I'm here now. Finally, um, I have been asked. Uh, why in these last couple of weeks I haven't mentioned anything about the, uh, the Israeli-Hamas war. And um, I'll, I'll be very honest on it. It's just, uh, when I look at Matthew chapter 24, and Jesus says, it, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, and so forth. He said, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning of the end. And so I don't get all hyped up on, you know, uh, which city they took this week and which uh, province they took, uh, you know, last week and how many prisoners they got and so forth. Um, all this uh, itemized stuff, it's, it's just nothing in that sense. I mean, it's exciting and it's, uh, it's indicative that we are getting very, very, very close to the last days, but... I, as we mentioned last week in the message, I am much more impressed about Jesus' answer to the disciples when they specifically ask him, what are these signs of your coming? Because that's what they expected. You know, well, the, the, the sun's going to rise in the west instead of in the east, or uh, we're going to get this out of the other thing in nature. Um, they wanted a sign that they could point to. And he said the first word out of his mouth, let no man deceive you. So his focus was entirely different on the itemized things that are happening in this world, um, as opposed to the, the nature of deception that is going on in the church. And so um, I, I think this thing is interesting and it's exciting, but I don't get... Uh, I don't get wrapped up in it on the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it. So today I want to look at something in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, we are going to be setting the stage for the greatest event that this world has ever known. And it is not the creation. It is not the fall. It is, it's not the cross. The greatest event that will take place in the history of this planet will be the second coming of Jesus Christ. You realize that the second coming of Jesus Christ has two parts to it. The first part is he comes for his church. The second part, seven years later, he comes with the church. First time is not technically the second coming because he's only coming for the church. The world's not going to see him. The world's not going to, all they're going to know is, boom, the rapture took place. But as far as the world is concerned, that's not the second coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 19, seven years after the rapture, when Jesus comes back with the church, that is technically the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there is more said in this Bible about the second coming of Christ than any other topic, any other subject, any other anything in this entire Bible. That is the focus. So we're setting up for that. The world's getting ready. There's definitely wars and rumors of wars. Um, Anti-Semitism is raising its ugly head again. And um, all the dominoes are starting to fall just like they're supposed to fall. You know, on his first coming, there was four accounts given in the Bible about Jesus' first coming. 
You have one in Matthew. You have one in Mark. You have one in Luke. And you had one in John. Four separate accounts of his first coming. Same way for his second coming. In the book of Revelation, there are four accounts of his coming. You know, the second coming. And the one that we're going to look at, well, we won't get to that today. This is just a setup for it. But hopefully next week, uh, we can actually get into, you know, verse 11 and so forth, uh, the actual second coming. So just like there was four accounts for his first coming, there are four accounts of his second coming. And before we get to the second coming, there is some housekeeping things that he has to do and he has to, to make right. We've gone through a bunch of things in the last days. We, we've seen the rapture. Uh, we've seen the abomination of desolation. We've seen the rise of the Antichrist and the false prophet. We've seen the 144,000. We've seen the two witnesses. Uh, we, we've seen all these different things having to do with the tribulation. We've seen the sun, the moon, and the stars all getting whacked out. We've seen uh, nature just go crazy. We've seen the, the 200 million horsemen, you know, the kings of the east uh, come through. We've seen the battles between the Antichrist and his enemies and so forth. Uh, we've seen all this stuff. But before he comes back, this is between the rapture and the second coming. Jesus has to do some housekeeping of his own. There are some things that he has to take care of as far as the church is concerned. That's, that's us. So let me read this passage here. We got a Bible turned to uh, Revelation chapter 19. Beginning in verse 7. 19 verse 7. So let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. To him, obviously, is Jesus Christ. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. That's us, the church. And to her, the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me these are the true sayings of God so there's going to be after the rapture there's going to be a marriage supper. And during that marriage supper, certain things have to occur. I mean, there, there's a certain sequential sequence that is going to take place. And obviously we're going to be there because we're the, the secondary object of this thing. Jesus Christ is the primary object, uh, but we're secondary. And the Old Testament saints will be there. The tribulation saints will be there. And it, it's going to be a great big wedding. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Getting at verse uh, 20, 23, I think. Let me get to it here. Let's see. Uh, 22. Ephesians 5, 22. It says, wives. Now, I'll tell you, I'll give you a disclaimer here. We're not picking on the wives. When we get to the end of this thing, you'll see what we mean here. 
But since we're going to a wedding and we are the bride, Jesus is the groom, then it is applicable that we go to a passage such as this that's going to explain the dynamics between the wife and the husband in this respect. Wives, that's us, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now see, guys love that verse. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And if you're not a very good character-wise husband, you'll, you'll run this verse right into the ground. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Oh boy, we're doubling down now, aren't we? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. You see how Paul is making this connection? He's looking for an earthly thing that he can explain a heavenly experience. And so when he's trying to explain the relationship of Jesus and the church, he looks around, the best thing he can find that we can relate to is the relationship of a husband and a wife. Now, we, over the years and centuries and, and so forth, we take these two verses right here, you know, wives submit yourselves unto your husband, and uh, husband is the head of the wife, and we've really watered that down. And I can remember even, you know, in my lifetime, you know, starting back in the 60s and so forth, you know, women's lib and all this stuff came to the fore. And the whole concept, of a woman being in subject, uh, subjection to a man or her husband was just totally, totally alien to these folks. And they went off the deep end on it. But we're not done yet. It gets better. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Oops, he's tripled down now. First he started out, wife submit, and he says, uh, uh, the husband is the head of the wife, and now, good grief, uh, let the wives be to their own husbands and everything, subject to them. But now he puts some balance into it. So if you want to cherry pick, and that's what a lot of people do when it comes to the Bible, they have an agenda, and they will come to the Bible to back up their agenda. And so when I use the expression cherry picking, that's, that's what I mean. You have a, a preconceived idea. And so now you're going to go to the Bible and try to find a verse that's going to back up and solidify your particular point. And so you can, you can find verses that are gonna virtually say everything if you look long enough. Why do you think the, the impetus of a million different translations of the Bible is out there? You just keep making new translations to put in verses in the Bible that will justify your particular agenda. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, for instance, then you'll print a new Bible that says that Joseph is Jesus' father. Luke 2.38, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, he might be a God, but he's not God as such, then you'll make out a new translation that says that Jesus is just a God. And so the translations just keep coming and coming and coming and coming so that people can cherry pick whatever they want and still claim, oh, it's in the Bible. So if some guy, husband, male, wants to lord it over women, he's got three verses here that he can cherry pick and he can make himself feel good all the way around the block. But now here comes the balance. Verse 25, husbands. We started off with the wives. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church 
and gave himself for it. Now, does that sound, if you love the, your wife the way Christ loved the church, are you, when you get home from work and she doesn't have the, the food on the table, you know, the, the second you walk in the door, you're going to slap her upside the head? Or if she didn't put the right menu on the table for you, are you going to punch her out? Or if when you're sitting there watching TV, if she doesn't get you a beer when you need it, are you going to lay into her? See, a lot of times the guys, they, they love those three verses and said, wives, submit yourselves and you know obey your uh, husband and so forth. They love those. But when it comes to the husband that he is supposed to love his wife as, not just love your wife. Everybody, you know, oh yeah, I love my wife. Back, back, back. Oh yeah, I love my wife. Whoop, whoop, whoop. No, no, no. That, that's not how it works. You love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He died for her. You know, these guys that get off work on Friday night. And then they, you know, drink themselves, you know, to a stupor, you know, up by four in the morning. Then they get up at noon and they start drinking again. Hurting their wives, intimidating their wives, scaring their wives. Oh, they don't cherry pick this first, do they? Ah, I'm getting off track here. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, washing of water by the word. That he might present it. We're still talking about the church now. Jesus loved himself, gave himself for the church. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it, that it should be holy, and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. There's no guy on the face of the earth that doesn't love himself. Every guy loves himself. That's how we're supposed to love our wives. So Jesus has to present the church as a holy entity. There's a problem. One monster, monster problem. That is, we see in Romans chapter 3 that there is none righteous, no, not one. Now we're talking about everybody here. Everybody in the church. I know the analogy here is the, the church is the bride and Jesus is the groom. But now when we get into the, the subject of righteousness and so forth, now everybody's in the same basket. Romans tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans tells us that nobody seeks after God. Nobody's any good. Nobody. Isaiah, chapter 64. Turn over there for a second. Ah, so thin. Isaiah 64. Okay, and here's the big problem. Isaiah 64, 6. That we are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We saw back in Revelation 19 that we are going to be clothed in fine linen, white 
and clean. We don't have fine linen, white and clean right now. All of our righteousnesses, the best that we can do on this spiritual level, the best that we can do from God's standpoint, from that standpoint of holiness, not comparing ourselves to each other. I mean, if one guy gives a dollar to charity and another guy gives a million dollars to charity, well, the world, you know, stands up and claps for the guy who gave the million bucks. You know, the guy who goes out and he has a, a stack of blankets that he's going to give to the homeless, as opposed to the guy who just sits in the house and doesn't think about the homeless. Well, the world's going to apply to the, to the guy who gave the blankets out to the homeless. So in our li little pecking order here, we can compare ourselves to each other. And we pat ourselves on the back and we hold a uh, little, uh, we give each other medals and plaques and we have suppers and dinners and honorariums and so forth. And, and we think that we're really great. You know, some club gives us a, a banquet and a, a little plaque and so forth. We get honored by the city council or something. And in our world, in our little group, we think we're doing good. That's fine and dandy. There's not, not, nothing wrong with charitable acts. But don't let it go to your head and think that because you're doing charitable acts, that somehow that translates into holiness. Because God looks into your heart and he can see what's going on behind the scenes. He can see, well, maybe you gave uh, that uh, thing for a tax write-off. Maybe uh, you want to ease your conscience because you've uh, messed around or you've done something. And so you're out giving money to the homeless or blankets to the homeless or uh, working in a soup line or something. There's always a motive here for this stuff. Nobody's altruistic. Nobody does something without a reason for it. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. So that is problem number one right there. How do we get rid of these filthy rags and put on the white linen, fine and clean? Well, there is something that takes place between the rapture and the second coming. We know that the tribulation is going on down here in this earth. All the bad things, you know, that are listed in, in Revelation from, you know, chapter 4 through uh, chapter 18. But at that same time, in heaven, there's also something going on up there. There's two things, really. Number one is the judgment seat of Christ. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The other, as we listed here in Revelation 19, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the judgment seat of Christ, that is where all of our righteousnesses are wiped out in that sense. I mean, we, we get saved in our, you know, we're going to go to heaven. But from the time you get saved to the time you either die or the rapture comes, you've built up a whole new layer of sins. From the time that you were born again until you die or the rapture comes, you've got a whole new list of things. These have to be addressed. That is where we talk about the wood, hay, the stubble, the gold, silver, precious stone. Our deeds, our thoughts, our motives, our actions, they are all classified into various components. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. So the cumulative effect or the cumulative result of your life as a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ, all these things that you've done, all the motives that you've done them for, all the reasons and so forth, they're going to be classified as various objects. They're going to be set in a great big giant pile. God is going to light a match to it. And whoosh, if there's anything left, you're going to get a reward. If there's nothing left, well, you don't get a reward. You're still going to go to heaven. 
but you're not going to get a reward. It's at that point, once the match has been lit, and all the sins that you've committed, all the ulterior motives that weren't right have been done, all the self-serving, all the fooling yourself, fooling everybody else, it's all going to be exposed. It's all going to be expunged. And at that point, God will give us the fine linen, white and clean. Marriage in Jesus' day, it, it was a lot different than it is now. Um, in Jesus' day, it was the parents of the, you know, the boy or the girl, man the, you know, man and the girl. Um, it was the parents who picked who the, the mate was going to be. And sometimes this was done really, really, early. I mean, as little kids, I mean, you know, they're still out there playing hopscotch or tiddlywinks or whatever. But the parents would get together and for, and there was a lot of reasons for this. Uh, the society in which they live, you know, there's no stock market as such that you could, you know, get rich overnight. Uh, technology wasn't at a point that, you know, one day you're just a regular guy and then two years later you're worth, you know, $10 billion or so. Um, it was an agrarian, very, very low key culture in that respect. And so your wealth, your security was based on an entirely different format than we have now. Number one, you wanted to have a lot of kids. You know, it wasn't like today. Oh, well, you know, I don't want to have kids or I don't want to have kids until, uh, you know, I'm settled in my career. Or in China and places like that, there's just too many people. There's too many mallows to feed. And so now we got to start culling the herd here. Um, in those days, you wanted a lot of kids. Because, it, like I said, it was an agrarian-based society. If you were a fisherman, well, if you had one boy out there, you know, maybe 12, 13, 14 years old helping you out uh, on the boats and so forth, that's one thing. If you got five or six, eight or ten kids helping you out, then your chances of success and your security in old age is going to be a lot better. Same thing if you're a uh, uh, cattle or sheep or goats or something. You can know it takes so many people to watch and tend and protect and care for so many animals. And so if you've only got one or two kids, theoretically and realistically, you can only have so big of a herd. If you've got a dozen kids, boy, the sky's the limit here. So there was a lot of practical reasons why they had this system set up. There's no way they're going to let their future and their generational future be dependent on the whim of a couple of, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old horny kids uh, wanting to hook up and get married. No, no, no. They weren't going to trust their future and the generation's future on that. So from a societal standpoint, it was the parents who picked who you were going to marry. And at that point, they would write a contract between the two families that, you know, when, uh, when Susie here gets, uh, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, whatever, uh, she will become the wife of, uh, you know, Joseph over there, or whatever it happens to be. And at that point, when they're still little kids or so, they are technically, from a legal standpoint, married. At that point. Now, they're not going to force the kids into, you know, literal marriage marriage, you know, when they're 8, 9, 10, 12 years old and stuff. When they got to that appropriate age, which was basically puberty in that culture, when they got to that age, then we go to the next step. The next step was that the groom would come. This is the guy who, you know, the parents set them up with this little girl, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the groom would come 
and he would take his bride to the new home or the house that he had built for her. You ever wondered why? Uh, turn, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. I always thought this was an, was an interesting passage here. It's got to do with the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1 beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. Now we don't know at what age Mary was. We don't know what age Joseph was. Uh, there are some traditions that say that Mary was literally Joseph's second wife. It's all speculation. We don't know. Uh, we can't be sure. But they were espoused, which in our term would be engaged. But in those days, the engagement was a literal contract. It wasn't just the guy gave her the ring and okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all, you know, all happy and giddy and, you know, we're engaged and so forth. And then a week later, they have a big fight and she either keeps the ring or she gives them back the ring and they're out. No, no, no. In these days, we can do that. In those days, once the betrothal was there, that was a legal binding contract. So, when is his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, now they're just betrothed. Her husband, it says, a just man, and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately. That means a divorcement. I mean, here they're legally bound. They haven't committed any act that would, you know, consummate the thing yet, but legally they're bound as husband and wife. Oops, lo and behold, he finds out she's pregnant. He knows it's not him. When she knows it's nobody, it's the Holy Spirit. God had already, you know, give her a heads up on that one. But she knows that she's in the clear here. Joseph, he knows he's not the part of this pregnancy. And so his mind goes exactly where you think it's going to go, where every guy in the face of the earth mind would go. Mary screwed around. She, she goofed up. So he was minded to, he's, he's such a nice guy though, he could have done that publicly, you know, made a big spectacle and publicly divorced her, accused her, made her feel bad and so on and so forth, but he didn't. But he could have legally because they were betrothed. Now, after the contractual Betrothal, as I said, then the groom comes. This is the mid East, you know, Jesus Day type wedding thing. The groom would come, take the bride back to his home. And at that point, there would be the. Oh, before I get that part, back to the home. Turn to John chapter 14. John 14. Beginning of verse 1. Jesus is speaking here. And in John 14, 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
This is exactly what a mid-east Jesus Day type wedding thing was. The groom would come and take his bride back to his place. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. You can see where I'm going on this. The, the similarities uh, between what took place in Jesus' day and what takes place now. You have a contract. The two kids are betrothed. It's not like they're doing it. It's the parents are doing it for them, but they are still legally betrothed. If we take that into our scenario, that's our salvation. We get saved. Once we're saved, we are in the family of God. We are born again. We are children of God. Our, saint, our, our fate, our destiny, our everything is sealed and set in place for an eternity. Well, what was the next part of the, uh, the Middle East wedding thing? The groom would come and take the wife back to his place. It's the rapture. So the betrothal is salvation. The groom coming and take the wife back with him, that's the rapture. Now she has to be cleansed. She's got filthy rags on all of our righteousness. There's filthy rags when we go up to meet Jesus. We're going up in filthy rags. At the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that's when we get the new robes, the new linen as such, white and clean, the righteousness of the saints. And that won't happen until the judgment seat, when all the, the wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone is laid on that heap, and the fire is lit, and the bad stuff is all burned away. And what's left? Gold, silver, precious stone. The rewards that we're going to get. The linen is now white and clean. Well, what's the, the, the last thing on this little sequence? It's got to be a honeymoon. Where the two, you know, are together and they go off and it's just them and no family as such. No, nobody else around. Just the two of them getting to know each other and so forth. Is there a honeymoon here? Uh, it's called the millennium. Thousand year reign of Christ. Which we are ruling and reigning with him. Before God makes the new heaven, new earth, and eternity begins, we, having gone through the betrothal aspect, salvation, having gone through the groom coming and taking us, the rapture, having gone through the cleansing, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and now the honey, the thousand-year millennial reign, of Christ. That's all to set us up for probably the greatest section in this Bible, the greatest event that will take place on this earth. As I said, it wasn't creation, it wasn't the fall, it wasn't, it wasn't the cross. Jesus Christ is coming back. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, 
I thank you for these promises. I thank you for this assurance. I thank you for the confidence that we can gain knowing that regardless of how bad it may seem to us on an individual basis, as we're still stuck here on this earth, as it were, all the, the times that we disappoint you, all the times that we sin, all the times that we are just so lazy and lax a days ago, the times that we don't think about you, the times that we may, might think about you, but it, it's for what can you do for me? Help me, give me this, do this for me. Lord, please, I need that. Uh, Lord, there, there's an entirely different set of conditions out there. But he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have fellowship with us. He wants us just to, to enjoy him for what he is, not necessarily for what he can do for us. That's our thing. But he just wants to hang out with us, as it were. But sometimes we get so hung up on our needs, our wants, our restrictions, the things that we don't have, the things that we wish we had, but we're, we're never in the moment. We're either regretting what we did before or we're anticipating what's in the future. We never seem to live in the present with our Lord and Savior, just communing with him and fellowshipping with him. And Lord, I pray today that you would give us that sense of urgency, that we wouldn't maximize and fixate on the past or dream and hope of the things that we can get in the future. But Lord, help us to appreciate the present. Help us to appreciate our time here with Christ because this, this is a unique time because once we get to heaven, all physical restrictions are off. Uh, we'll have the mind of Christ. We'll, we'll have things that we can't even begin to imagine. But it's here in this world that we can appreciate what he has for us and what he can do for us in that sense by not just a litany of things, gimme, 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 gimme. But Lord, thanks for what you have done. Thanks. For what you are doing and thanks for what you will do Lord I thank you for this book I thank you for the confidence the assurance the promises everything that goes with it that in, this, in spite of the setbacks the inhibitions the weaknesses the diseases the everything falling apart I don't have to despair I don't have to get bummed out there's an end to this thing, and I can see the end. It's getting really close. So, Father, in these last days, give us, each and every Christian, that second wind, as it were, that we can cross that finish line. Maybe not first or not second, but that we can say that we did our best with your help. Father, bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name.